All right, so this week in analytical chemistry, we want to shift our attention to titrimetry. So when we're doing titrations, we're going to add a reagent called the titrant to another solution that contains another reagent that's called the titrand. And then they'll react in, their, in our chemical reaction. So there are four main categories of titration. These include acid-base titrations, complexometric titrations, which are usually metal ligand complexation reactions. You can do redox titrations with oxidizing and reducing agents, and you can do precipitation titrations. So all of the titrations have some common features. They all have what are called equivalence points and endpoints, and we'll talk about definitions of these here in a minute. They use volume as their signal, and you generate titration curves that you can display graphically. So we'll figure out how to do that. And they're all going to use the burette as the source of delivering the titrant. So the first thing we want to do is talk about the equivalence point. So these types of reactions are using stoichiometry to determine the concentrations of an analyte in a sample. Right? And to do this, we're going to mix the titrant in with the titrand. So the titrand is going to be our sample that has the analyte in there. And the titrant is going to be our known solution that we know the concentrations of. And so if we have a chemical reaction that we can relate these two, we can use whatever is in the titrant to be able to help us calculate the analyte that's in our titrand. And by using titrimetry, this happens when we reach the equivalence point where the concentration of the titrant is going to equal the concentration of the titrand. So if we're going to have accuracy in our titrations, we need to know the exact volume of the titrant when it reaches that equivalency point. And we're going to call that volume uh, VEQ for the volume at the equivalency point. So if we know that volume at the equivalency point and we know the concentration of our solution, that is the titrant, we can calculate the moles of the titrant from that information, right? So we know the molarity of our titrant and we just did our uh, volume of, at the equivalency point. That's going to be our reaction that we're doing with the titration. And if we multiply this, right, because uh, molarity is really moles, right, per liter. And then if we have our volume in liters, those two things will cancel out. And we'll be left with the moles of the titrant. So if we know the stoichiometry or our reaction, right, we can write a balanced equation for what's going on in there. We can then calculate the moles of the titrant. And we will come back to this and, and have some sample problems in a few minutes. So before we get there, let's talk about the end point of the reaction and how that differs from the equivalence point, right? So often it's hard for us to visibly see the equivalence point. And so we have to use another marker um, that is very close to that to be able to see the finish point of the reaction. And so we will call that the end point. And so it doesn't necessarily totally overlap with the equivalence point, but it should be very, very close, right? So the end point is often going to be indicated by an indicator or a substance that we add to our titrant to be able to visualize or see a color change that is very, very close to the equivalence point. So that change in color is going to help us decide when to stop the reaction and to read the volume that we've used of our titrant. So the difference between the endpoints volume and the real equivalence point volume is a determinant error, right? It's always going to be in that same direction because the indicator is either going to be just above or just below our actual equivalence point. And so that does introduce some bias into this type of analysis. However much this is, that's the titration error. So if 
the volumes of the endpoint and the equivalence point are very close, then this error is going to be insignificant and we can ignore it in that case. If it's too big though, we need to find a better indicator that's going to be uh, close to that equivalence point so that we can use it for our reaction. So almost any chemical reaction can be used in a titrometric method as long as it meets these four criteria. So we have to know the stoichiometry between the titrant and the titrant. And the titration reaction has to go to completion, right? You can't have it go halfway. Then you can't ever reach the equivalence point or the end point of the reaction. The titration reaction also has to occur fairly rapidly, right? If it's a very slow reaction, then you're likely to add too much titrant when you're doing that titration reaction because you can't visibly see that the equivalence point happen or the end point of the reaction because it's going too slowly and you have to wait, right? Um, so you have to have a reaction that occurs fairly rapidly. And then you also have to have a suitable method for accurately determining the end point. So if you can't visibly see the true reaction, you have to have some sort of indicator that's going to be very close to that equivalence point. Volume is also used as the signal for titration reactions, right? So you're going to be reading your volume from the burette when you're doing the titrations. Remember that burettes have significance out to the hundredths point. So if it's right on the 10 mil line, you have to make sure that you take your volumes and that you place out those zeros to the hundredths position. Don't forget to do that. So include your significant figures always. So always be sure to include those significant figures. Very, very critical, even if those significant figures are zeros at those positions. Okay, and so this is where we get our determinant error for the reaction. This is the titration error, and it's caused by that difference between the endpoint that is our indicator, right, and the true equivalence point of the reaction. All right, so here's an example of a reaction that we could do with an indicator, right? So this reaction is going to be between silver cations and the thiocyanate anion, and it will form silver thiocyanide, which is a solid. So this is a precipitation reaction, right? So this reaction is going to occur quickly. It has known stoichiometry, and these satisfy at least two of our requirements. And then because this is forming a precipitate in the solution, it's fairly hard to see the end of the reaction because the precipitate actually gets in the way. So because of this, we, we also have another indicator that we're going to add to the reaction. We're going to add a small amount of iron to the reaction as well. Iron will also react with the thiocyanite, and this is our, going to be in our reaction, the titrant. Right? In this case, we want to find out how much silver we have. So this is the titrand in the reaction. And then this would be in the burette, and we're dropping that into our solution over time. And then it's going to have the reaction go to completion. So we, if we also add a little bit of iron to the reaction, right, the iron can also react with the thiocyanate, but it's not as reactive. The silver reacts very quickly and will react first if it's available. Right? But if you run out of the silver, then the iron can start reacting with the thiocyanate and it can act as an indicator in this case. So this um, reaction is producing a nice bright yellow solid here. The reaction with iron in the thiocyanate, this reaction produces a red colored product that you can then see. So when you start seeing that red product form, this is going to signal that you have formed this iron thiocyanate complex, and that would be the end point of the reaction. So let's take a look at what this would look like, right? So this is an example of a direct titration because the titrant is reacting directly with the analyte in your solution. The titrant, again, is the thiocyanate, 
it's reacting directly with the silver that you have in the solution to form this yellow precipitate. But you can see how thick that yellow precipitate is and you wouldn't know where to stop the reaction. So adding that little bit of iron in there, when you start seeing this red color appear, that's when you know you've reached the end point of the reaction, when that iron starts reacting with the thiocyanate. All right, so in the next section, we'll talk about back titrations.